Friends, welcome to worship on this Pentecost Sunday, the day where we remember God's Spirit coming and filling the people of God with the Holy Spirit and empowering them and filling them and sending them out to the world to share God's boundless love. And how appropriate it is for us today that we are celebrating this gathered in our own homes, scattered throughout the city and throughout the world, not contained in one building, but truly being the people of God in the world for the world so that the world could could know love. I am so excited to be with all of you today as we gather together for worship. My name is Ren Serna. I'm the senior pastor here at University Presbyterian Church, and it is such a gift to be reminded of the fact that the church isn't a building. It's the people. It's, it's you and me together, and that together the mission to share God's boundless love continues. If you are a guest with us today, I'm so glad that you're here. If you're watching live, you can comment and just introduce yourself. Let us know that you're here, or you can fill out a connection card at upcfresno.org slash connect. This just helps us to welcome you and to know how to care for you and to thank you for coming. We would love to be able to start that um, journey with you and to make a new friendship together as we all are seeking to find God's love in this uncertain time. As we do gather together today, scattered throughout our world, I invite you to center your hearts as much as you're able to still your devices and the distractions around you and to join together in song. This is my prayer when all that's within me feels dry This is my prayer and my hunger in me My God is the God who provides This is my prayer in the fire In weakness or trial or pain There is a faith proved of more worth than gold So we find me, Lord, through the fire I will bring praise, I will bring praise, no weapon formed against us shall remain. I will rejoice, I will declare, that is my victory and he is here. This is my prayer in the battle, when triumph is still on
Hi, I'm Dustin Maddox, and I'm the associate pastor here, and I have a couple of announcements for us. The first is that last week we began a new small group centered around this book, Reunion, the Good News of Jesus for Sinners, Saints, and Seekers by Bruxy Cavey. And there is still time for you to join me on Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. We'd love for you to have uh, to participate in this conversation around this book with us. And then uh, one way that we're continuing to love and serve our community with our weekly food distribution is uh, by extending an invitation and an opportunity for you to fill a bag that we will use on our Saturday distributions to supplement the food that we get from the Central California Food Bank. And so you can go to our website, upcfresno.org food for a list of shelf stable food items that you can fill a brown recyclable grocery bag with and drop by the church office here on Fridays uh, between nine and noon. And then finally, as we are continuing uh, to be in our neighborhoods a little more than we may be used to, we want to provide you with a resource to share this community with others in your neighborhood. And so next Sunday, June 7th, from 4 to 6 p.m., you can come by and drive through the church parking lot where Ren and I will be to hand you a yard sign that says love isn't canceled. And it has our website that will direct people here so they can view services like this and be equipped with resources they need to love and serve their neighbors. So we would love for you uh, to participate in this with us next Sunday, the 7th, from 4 to 6 p.m. And now we are going to turn our hearts and minds and spirits to hearing a word from Jesus to us today. And we're excited to have Simon Biasel with us this morning to share God's word with us. So let's turn our attention now to hearing a good and encouraging word from the Psalms this morning. Today's scripture passage is Psalm 12. Help, O Lord, for there is no longer anyone who is godly. The faithful have disappeared from humankind. They utter lies to each other with flattering lips and a double heart they speak. May the Lord cut off all flattering lips, the tongue that makes great boasts. Those who say, with our tongues, we will prevail. Our lips are our own. Who is our master? Because the poor are despoiled, because the needy groan, I will rise up, says the Lord. I will place them in the safety for which they long. The promises of the Lord are promises that are pure, silver refined in a furnace on the ground, purified seven times. You, O Lord, will protect us. You will guard us from this generation forever. On every side the wicked prowl, as vileness is exalted among humankind. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God within us, and for the word of God amongst us, thanks be to God. When Wren came to me with this opportunity to preach on this series on the Psalms, she gave me a list of different Psalm genres that I could choose from. And those genres included ones that I recognized like Psalm of praise or Psalm of joy, Psalm of lament. But as I read through, there was one that I didn't quite recognize and I don't know if I'd ever heard before, the Psalm of anger. But once I started reading through some of those psalms of anger, I thought, oh no, I recognize these. I recognize them because pretty much every day since shelter in place, my two kids, six years old and nine years old, have pretty much been reciting these psalms daily. It usually goes something like this. Uh, two kids are screaming back and forth, and then one starts crying. 
And that one who cries comes to me, gets in my face and says something like, I've had it with my sister. She's ripping my head off. You need to do something about it. I think you need to start spanking her. Psalm of anger where somebody has had wrong done against them. Someone has been hurt, somebody has been oppressed, someone is surrounded by evil, someone who lies continue to be told about. And they come to God and they want God to do something about it. And ultimately, these are not just psalms of anger, but they're psalms of vengeance. Psalms of people coming and tattletaling. And like tattletaling, we kind of have this negative connotation about vengeance, especially for us Christians who are told by Jesus to turn the other cheek. In fact, C.S. Lewis says about Psalms of vengeance that Christians should avoid them because Christians shouldn't have thoughts of violence. Or thoughts of vengeance. Well, that's great if you're C.S. Lewis, but for the rest of us, what are we supposed to do with these thoughts of vengeance that we do have? One way is by going and acting out those thoughts of vengeance. That when somebody has harmed us, we go back and do something that make them regret harming us. And maybe you've sought out vengeance. Maybe you are somebody who is prone to seek out vengeance. However, we know that at the end of vengeance is not resolution. That maybe before we act out vengeance, we think that it will fulfill us and that it will make things right. But in reality, at the end, it doesn't make things right. And oftentimes, it just makes things worse. And so what are we supposed to do when we have these thoughts of vengeance? I don't think just suppress them. That doesn't end up well either. Usually, we take out vengeance that we intended for somebody else on somebody who had some, that had nothing to do with whatever we are angry about. And so that's why I think these psalms of vengeance are actually quite valuable and important and useful. So much so that it's made me re, it has reshaped my thinking about my kids coming and telling on their sibling. Because what I realize they're doing is one, they're asking for my help. Things have gotten out of hand and they need help. But on top of that, Instead of doing harm for harm, instead of seeking vengeance on their sibling, they do the opposite. And they probably do the opposite because they realize that if they do repay harm for harm, that things will not be good. That the screaming and crying will get out of hand and mom or dad will come in and everyone will be in trouble that the consequences of vengeance are not worth it. And so my kids realize that it's better off that they come and tell me. And I'll be honest, usually what I do is borderline shame them. I call them tattletales and tell them to deal with it on their own. But really, they're doing the right thing. They're coming and they're calling out they're doing these, acting out these psalms of vengeance. See, when we go out and we act in vengeance, what we do, what we're doing is we are going back to the place where evil happened. We go back to the place where wrong happened. We go back to the people who did wrong. And instead of making things right, we end up ensnaring ourselves in that which is wrong. We go back to the place where sin happens and we end up getting wrapped up in sin. 
And so we need to avoid that. Now, before we go any further, I want to talk about the difference between vengeance, seeking vengeance, and seeking protection. Seeking vengeance is offensive. That after something has happened, we go back and try and make things right. But seeking protection is defensive. In the moment, we are doing whatever we can to stop the hurt or minimize the hurt or prevent the hurt or get us away from the hurt. And seeking protection is really what a psalm of vengeance is all about. Instead of going back to the perpetrator, we are going the opposite way towards God. Instead of us going to, in this psalm, mouths filled with lies, we are going to a God filled with promises that are pure. And when we go and we act out these psalms of vengeance, and we pray these psalms, what we're doing is that we are praying that God would show up in ways that I believe are miraculous. I believe that God has the power to transform people's lives from doing wrong to doing right. Transform people's lives of evil to lives of righteousness. But as we're praying for that miraculous thing to happen, something psychological happens to us at the same time. And we see it in this psalm. At the beginning of this psalm, the person wants violence and pain to come down and rain heavy upon this person who hurt them. They want God to cut off lips, and while he's at it, cut off a tongue. But that tone changes at the end of the psalm. They're no longer seeking violence, but they're ultimately seeking is protection. And when we are filled with rage, yes, there are times, admittedly, that we want acts of violence to come down upon others who've hurt us. And we are full of anger. But at the root of that anger, we know is our fear. And that fear is driving our anger to think that if we don't stop them, if we don't teach them a lesson, we are going to be in danger again. But here's the reality. That's not going to make things better, and it won't necessarily make us safer. However, God, God is the one who can make us safer. God's pure promise is that when we cry out that we will receive the safety that we deserve, that this is who God is. And so instead of going back to that place where only harm is done, both to them and to us, we go the opposite direction. We go away from them and we go to God. And in God, God's promises are fulfilled and we are made safe. Amen. Friends, each and every week we gather around this table. This table which reminds us that God is present with us wherever we may be, that God's love nourishes us and sustains us even when we are apart and even when we face the difficulties and tragedies that life presents us. Because this is a table that is set not under ideal circumstances, but in the midst of reality itself, the reality of pain and injustice, the reality that authorities often 
misuse power to brutalize others. The fact that the reality that life is vulnerable. And so we come to this table, come bringing our full selves. All of you is invited to this table, whether you are angry at injustice, angry at the state of the world, whatever you are carrying today, know that it is welcome here. And it is met and received by Jesus who receives you. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he gathered his friends around him at a table and he took a loaf of bread and he gave thanks for it and he blessed it and he broke it. And he said, this is my body given for you. And in the same way, he took a cup of the fruit of the vine and he blessed it and he gave thanks for it. And he said, this is the cup of the new covenant poured out in my blood for the forgiveness of your sins. And every time you take this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim my life and my death and my resurrection until I come again. In these elements, Jesus, the life of God, the love of God is revealed to us. And so we pray now that by the presence and power and protection and provision of the love of God, that these ordinary elements of grain and grape would be transformed into the nourishment of heaven that will sustain us for life's journey. Amen. You are welcome to participate in this feast by utilizing whatever elements you have around you in your home, whether it's crackers or chips or a piece of bread and juice or wine. But know that this is the feast of God prepared for you, the people of God. Take and eat. In my wrestling, in my doubts, in my failures, you won't walk out. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. You are the peace in my troubled sea. In the silence you won't let go. In the questions your truth will hold. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Oh, you are the peace in my troubled sea. Shining in the darkness, I will
As we turn now to God in prayer, we wanted to take a minute to pastorally address the profound grief and anger and pain that has surfaced in our country over the last few months, but in particular this week with the death of George Floyd in Minneapolis. And with the Psalms as our guide, we want to step into this pain, this anger, and this sorrow and lament the reality that our black and brown brothers and sisters are systematically losing their lives in this country. And we are not taking a stand on the left or the right, but we are standing in line with Jesus and the kingdom. And as I've been seeing the news and processing this week, the words of Dr. King have just echoed in my mind and in my heart that the greatest impediment, he writes in his letter from a Birmingham jail to the march towards freedom uh, for racial minorities is uh, not the Ku Klux Klan, but is white moderates who are more concerned with protecting and promoting order than they are for promoting justice. And uh, I, as one of your pastors, confess my own um, complicity and ignorance and privilege uh, that walls me off from the profound injustices that people in our own city and throughout our country experience on a daily, minute-by-minute -minute basis. And so with the hope of the New Jerusalem where the tree of life will uh, heal the divisions between the nations, we call on the name of Jesus to bring that healing into the present moment. And so I invite you to join me in prayer as we lift up the cries of our brothers and sisters and our hearts to God. So let's pray together. Gracious and ever-present God, on this Pentecost day, when you breathed your breath of life upon your people and birthed the church, we are very aware of the breath that has been taken from our black and brown brothers and sisters in this country. And our hearts are filled with sorrow, our bodies are filled with rage, our minds are filled with doubt and confusion about what it would take for justice to flow like streams, as the prophet Micah says. But God, we, in this moment, we look to the example of our brother Jesus, who participated in the sufferings of the people around him, who willingly set aside the privilege of heaven and all the power and the glory that was his by right. He set it aside by his own choice so that he could participate in our sufferings and so, God, stir up our hearts to follow the example of Jesus and do the same. Help us to have eyes that see and ears that hear injustices in our city, in our neighborhoods, and throughout this country. 
help us with m those of us with more privilege than we know what to do with be able to listen to the stories of our brothers and sisters so that we might learn what it's like to walk in their shoes. God, empower us to get to work at understanding our complicity in systemic racism and systemic injustice in our country and in our city, where those of us who live north east of highways 99 and 180 have a 20 percent higher life expectancy than those who live on the southeast side southwest side of our city god we cry out against the ways that walls are built uh, in the very neighborhood where we gather physically as a church that prevent us from joining in the lives of our brothers and sisters. And so God, we ask that you would empower your church to be ambassadors for your justice, to be advocates for peace and shalom that would restore and renew all things. We pray for all people who are losing sleep, who are afraid to go on runs or go to sleep for what might awaken them in the middle of the night. God, would you, would we become your children by hungering and thirsting for righteousness and justice? May we pursue your kingdom so thoroughly that our lives would be transformed so that we could transform our cities and our world. We pray this all in the name of our brother Jesus, who taught us to pray by saying together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now that we have prayed for God's justice, let's get to work at carrying it out in our world. Amen. Our first act after having received these good gifts from God is to return our gifts, the gifts that God has entrusted to us, to the God who can use them for the sake of love and for the sake of the world. One way that we can participate in the life of God by increasing our trust in God's protection and provision particularly in a time of economic uncertainty, is by entrusting our financial resources to God. And so you can give financially today by going to our website, upcfresno.org slash give and give online that way, or you can mail a check into the church office. And these gifts will be utilized to uh, to carry out our mission to joyfully share God's boundless love with all in our community without limitation, exception, or condition. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. Cleansing this I 
see nothing but the blood of Jesus for my pardon this my plea nothing but the blood of Jesus oh precious is the flow that makes me white as Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other found I know. Nothing but the blood. the blood of Jesus. Thank you for being with us, for opening yourselves to the possibility that God is with you and for you and equipping you to love and serve the world around you. And just a reminder, if you are a guest with us today, we would love to come alongside you in relationship and encourage you. So you can go to upcfresno.org slash connect and fill out a connection card. And as you go, may you go with the flame of the love of God burning within you. May the light of the life of Jesus guide your each and every step. And may it shine through you into the world of darkness and despair to bring hope and love and comfort to all you come across. May you go, beloved of God, in grace and peace. Amen.